Hello, BookTube. As I mentioned in an earlier video, uh, March of 2020 marks my fourth year on BookTube, my four-year anniversary. Uh, and although there are there, I've made, in that time made quite a few enemies, online Twitter enemies, who would say, uh, I would say who would chortle to themselves, but they don't have any sense of humor, but they would say to themselves, isn't it fitting that his four-year anniversary coincides with an international plague, an international pandemic? Uh, but fortunately, I'm not talking to them. <laughs> I'm talking to you. And as much as I might irritate you from time to time, I don't think any of you think I'm Satan incarnate. Uh, so I put out the call for questions for my for my four-year anniversary. And I got a bunch of questions. Uh, and I thought we'd go through them. Now, I always predict, <laughs> with these question and answer periods, I always predict that I can do it in one video. And it always ends up taking four videos. But there's fewer questions this time around. I think because I didn't put Q&A in the title. A few of you took me to task for that and said, why didn't you put the letters Q&A in the title of the video? You've gotten ten times more questions. I'm coming up on another Q&A. <laughs> so so uh, I'll remember that. But in the meantime, I thought we'd jump right into the questions that we have here and see what we can do with them. Uh, first one is from PHXSNS15, uh, who says, uh, What do you think of James Jones? Particularly Some Came Running and From Here to Eternity. I think Jones is great. Uh, I'm, I'm a little confused at why he, he seems to be forgotten. Uh, from Here to Eternity might get a reprint someday or even a Penguin Classic, but... Uh, or maybe, maybe uh, uh, from here to eternity, uh, some came running, and uh, what's this other one? What's the, the the big one that nobody knew what to do with? Uh, well, anyway, it's possible that they will get a Library of America volume. Robert Stone did, so it's possible that that uh, Jim Jones will. But one way or another, I like his books. They're they're not uh, they're not great art. They're they're sort of inelegantly written, but boy, are they involving! I think. Uh, and the, uh, the follow-up, the part, the other part of the question is, what do I think of Wally Lamb? Particularly, she's come undone, and I know this much is true. I don't like Wally Lamb's prose at all. I don't like his books at all. They just, they just strike me as turgid in a way that Jones is not. So I, I, I I've, I've never read anything by the man that I've liked. I've read all of his novels. Uh, uh, let's see here. Lev Mishkin uh, wants to know, has a few questions. Wants to know your favorite work by your beloved, beloved Virginia Woolf. Uh, favorite work of fiction. By Virginia Woolf. I, for me, I think it would go to Orlando. I know that that that's sort of not the right answer. You're supposed to say to the lighthouse, but uh, or Mrs. Dalloway. But I've always liked Orlando more. Uh, then also asks your favorite piece of Russian fiction and why. And in parentheses he says no saying crime and punishment just because of that amazing blurb. Oh, you mean this crime and punishment? <laughs> this is the Michael Katz translation with blurbs on the back by. Well, let's see who we have here. James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, Harold Bloom. Oh, me! <laughs> you mean not this one? <laughs> no, my, my favorite work of Russian fiction, of course, is War and Peace. Uh, uh, let's see here. Could you please rank this big six in terms of your favorites? Pushkin, Gogol, Dostoevsky, Turgenev, Chekhov, and Tolstoy. And I would rank them uh, exactly as you have them here. Pushkin, Gogol, Dostoevsky, Turgenev, and Chekhov, but way above all the rest, I would put Tolstoy. He is by far my favorite. Uh, how do you cope with the fraudulent population of, quote, readers? The type who educate people on literature they themselves haven't read, often making money doing so. I've had a long time to cope with such people. Uh, and I've, I've managed uh, by just finding an audience of my own, whether that was in person in bookstores or whether that was in print in reviews or whether that is now on this channel. Uh, I'd like to think that the, the pretenders that you're talking about are constantly suffering from the attrition of discovery. So they have, they have uh, let's say, in a given period of time, a hundred new people find them and say, all right, finally, I have found the guru, the book guru that I've always wanted. Finally, I found someone to pay attention to. I'd like to think that in the period where they get those 100 people, in, let's say, a month or a year or however long it takes for people to do the requisite reading, I would like to think that of those 100 people who go out and follow the recommendations that these people make when, as you correctly point out, they often don't read the books they're recommending, or are poor judges of what's good and bad. If you only read YA, for instance, even though you're uh, a lecherous 40-year-old, then you're going to be a poor judge. Not uh, not only of all the rest of literature, but also of YA. You're just going to be a poor judge of what you read, if that's all you do. And I would like to think that in whatever time period we're talking about, those hundred people 
fritter away. I'd like to think that 75 or 80 of them spend money on a book, God forbid, or go to the library and spend time on a book and realize, or maybe do it more than once, do it a few times and realize, that person doesn't have any idea what they're talking about. This thing's terrible. Even I know that. What were they thinking? And then you go back to the video and you dig around in the fine print and realize the thing was sponsored. I would like to think that 80 of those 100 people will start to feel betrayed and will look elsewhere. So the, the answer to the question, how do I deal with them? How do I cope with them? Is I concentrate on what I am doing myself. I take book recommending very, very seriously. And I would like to think that if I praise a book and give you specifics of why, so I don't just say, guys, I just got this in the mail, isn't this cover great? But I give you specifics of why I liked it, whether I'm doing it on this channel or I'm doing it in print or whatnot. I like... I, I believe very strongly, I care very much that that recommendation will hold water. And that, that if, that for instance, my equivalent of those hundred people, I would like to think that I wouldn't lose more than one or two. And that I would lose those one and two, not for, because I was wrong about the book that I recommended or damned, but because the person realized, okay, well, he wasn't wrong about this, but our tastes don't align. And even though some of the points that he made about this book that are correct, I still like it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I'd like to think those numbers are small. <laughs> I'd like to think that I wouldn't lose nearly as much as some of the posers that you're talking about. Um, and let's see, he also asked, see if I go on like this, we're never going to get done. Uh, what's it like being so well-read and subsequently so well-educated? Is it more of a curse than a blessing? In other words, your thoughts on my presuming that you see more and more how ridiculous people are and how superior dogs are. <laughs> People know me too well, I think. Of course, dogs are superior as company. I have one pressed uh, firmly against the lumbar region of my spine right now. <laughs> of course, they're better as company. They're better playmates. They're better uh, confidants. Uh, they're certainly better cheerleaders. But I don't say that all humans are ridiculous. And even when they're ridiculous, I know quite a few people who know they're ridiculous and, and are very funny about it. Now, I don't, uh, I don't, first of all, I don't, I don't, I am, I am well read and I was, I was carefully educated, but I don't consider those, it's almost in this, in this question, like those are some sort of moral advantage. And I don't consider them that at all. They're just tools. There's tools in a box. Uh, I, I rather like people, <laughs> humans. I rather like them. They're my second favorite species. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Tomorrow's Classic asks, where do I start if I want to read alternate history fiction? Uh, there's no there's no one place to start or stop. I, I presume you're asking for a couple of good recommendations. One I would certainly recommend would be Guns of the South by Harry Turtledove, which is alternate history in that it proposes what would happen, what would have happened if a box of modern automatic rifles had fallen into the hands of the Confederates during the American Civil War. Terrific. Absolutely terrific. There are plenty of others. I've shown so many of them. Like, for instance, there's one that I've shown on this channel a couple of times. I praise the daylights of it, but it is, I think, out of print and probably permanently so. And that is The Court Martial of George Armstrong Custer, a novel by an author whose last name is Douglas, I think, William Douglas, uh, which, which posits that the massacre at Little Bighorn happened exactly as we know it, but Custer survived and stood court martial. Uh, that's terrific as well. There are a bunch of others. But uh, but Gu Guns of the South will be available. Court Martial of George Armstrong Custer, I don't know one way or another. I'm getting more and more leery about recommending books on this channel because none of us can go out and get them unless you're comfortable with ebooks. I'm pretty sure that Guns of the South is an ebook. Uh, let's see here. Matthew L. says, I've noticed on your Goodreads account that, you're, that you've awarded poor review scores to both Les Miserables and 100 Years of Solitude. Could you talk a little about the issues you have with these novels? I, for one, hate Hugo's persistent use of coincidence as a means of moving the plot forward. Ma, well, you got a point there, don't you? <laughs> uh, and also about how you feel about Hugo and Marquez as a whole. Do either of them have a work that you think is particularly successful? See, I worry about that. I don't know what you saw on Goodreads, and I worry about that because I still, even now, in March of 2020, I still don't make proper use of Goodreads. I don't even have the app on my phone, which is what it's for. I, it, it's not meant to be used as a normal website. It's meant to be on your phone. I still don't make good use of it. I don't make lists. I don't regularly uh, include either snippet reviews or links to full-length reviews on the books that I read. I started kind of, sort of doing that in 2020 and then have dropped off. And I haven't gone back and looked at any of the things that I did. I'm sure that, that the Victor Hugo and the Marquez things that you're referring to here are from half a, de a decade ago. I'm sure they are. 
So I have no idea what was there or whether or not I was using the site correctly or whether or not I was wa watching my words correctly. <laughs> I need to go back and look at both of those. For, for In terms of just the general question, when we're not talking about Goodreads, uh, I love both authors. So I'm not 100% I'm not sure. Of course, I don't like Les Miserables at all. I don't know anybody that does. What I'm trying to remember who it was. Was it was it Peter Ackroyd who had a great quip about Les Miserables said this must be a great book because it sure isn't a good one. <laughs> I don't remember if it was Les Miserables he was talking about. I think it was. Uh, but I, I, in my case, the, the, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, I think, is pretty much a perfect novel in terms of its structure. I, I think it, it's fantastic. And Marquez is the same way. I, I have grown to like 100 Years of Solitude more the more I've read it. So I'm going to have to go back and look at Goodreads. Oh my God, I'm going to have to do that. It's where the readers are. It's insane that I've been leaving, that I've been leaving it alone. I, I, I will, your question will prompt me. Uh, Gandergelf, that well-known troublemaker, Gandergelf. Uh, what's up with your glasses? In your avatar, you're wearing glasses. I've also seen you wear them in other people's videos, but I've never seen you wear them in your own videos. Are you like Clark Kent and only wear them when you need to disguise yourself as a mild-mannered book reviewer? <laughs> okay. First, I know quite a few chapped and crestfallen authors over the last two decades who would not call me a mild-mannered book reviewer. <laughs> but no, sometimes you see me with glasses on, sometimes I'm wearing contact lenses. <laughs> Just kidding. Only a fool, an insane person, only a maniac would think it's a good idea. Yeah, I'm going to get up, I'm going to roll out of bed, I'm going to put a piece of plastic on top of my eyeball. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it there all day. Oh my god. <laughs> no. Now, maybe if I were trapped in a North Korean dungeon, they might do that to me, but I would never do it to myself. No, the, I, the gla my glasses sometimes help a little. Uh, they, help, they help a little bit with distance viewing. So sometimes if I'm out and about, I will have them on, but it's only very little. And I, vision is not one of my big senses at all. <laughs> it's not how I navigate outside almost at all. I navigate almost entirely by hearing uh, with a little detail thrown in to vision one way or another. So I can't count the number of times that I will go out with Frida for a walk and just leave the glasses here. I'll just forget. What do I care? <laughs> if things aren't in perfect focus, what do I care? I, I'm, that's not one of the things that I care about. I care about what it sounds like. I care very much about what it smells like. Uh, that that's the reason why I don't need them. I don't. I wouldn't. I don't wear my glasses twenty four hours a day, day in and day out. No, not at all. I need them for a little aid for for distance, fine detail distance work when I'm outside. But I don't need them otherwise. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Jack Riley says your thoughts on Raymond Chandler. He's really good for what he does. Let's not elevate him. <laughs> okay, he's really good for what he does. And what he does is write crap. <laughs> so let's let's keep that in perspective, okay? Uh, and also wants to know the outcome of Trump versus Biden in a post-pandemic world. That's a big question. <laughs> I'm not sure that it's one. I'm not sure that it's one that I should even hesitate to answer. That I should even venture to answer. I'm, I mean, you are all fantastic. And if I if I do something you think is dumb, you feel free to email me. My email will be in this email. It's in every email. And bless your hearts, a lot of you have been with me so long that you know that I'm a person and not Satan incarnate, the aforementioned Satan incarnate. So maybe you aren't aware of the the acidic hullabaloo that was all over that was all over a tiny little corner of Twitter about my coronavirus book tag. So maybe maybe the last thing in the world I should do is comment on a post pandemic world. I made that that coronavirus book tag in order to get you all to smile to distract you a little, to put the thing in perspective, and to keep us all talking about books. I did not make that tag in any way to trivialize this thing that I've been sounding the alarm about when you, back when all the rest of you were calling me paranoid and crazy. <sighs> Nevertheless, if you've, already, if you've already made enemies on Twitter, as I have, they will jump at, at, at such things. But uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, I do take the whole thing very seriously. I just, I thought of prompts and thought it would make a distracting discussion. And most of you agreed. I didn't start getting negative comments on that video until that whole Twitter thing happened. That might, as one of you as one of you put it, you know who you are. I said, could you, could you maybe go one anniversary without getting hashtagged on Twitter? <laughs> what can I say, baby? I'm a rebel. <laughs> I'm not, actually. <laughs> anyway, uh, the question, the outcome of Trump versus Biden in a post-pandemic world, 
uh, I, have, I have two comments. One, obviously I agree with all the political pundits in America and around the world who are saying that Joe Biden and his campaign are bungling the, uh, the chance of a lifetime to step forward and show the kind of compassionate, intelligent, informed leadership that America is not getting from its current president. Instead, we have a vindictive, uninformed, cartoonish thug at the White House podium pretty much every day. A thug, someone who was told yesterday that Mitt Romney is self-isolating because he was next to Rand Paul, who, is, who has this, this virus, and wants to be extra sure. And why does he want to be extra sure? Because he's of a certain age and because his wife has MS. She's vulnerable to this thing. And when the President of the United States was told that and didn't know it, he said, oh, he's self-isolating? Isn't that too bad? An absolute sociopath. <laughs> uh, that's what the United States is getting now for leadership. And it's about to get worse. Right now, the kabuki form of theater that we get for these press conferences is that the Trump will get up at the podium and say uh, six things. He will say six things about COVID-19, and all six of them will be completely wrong, dangerously wrong. And then... Instantly, he will leave the podium and instantly someone will come up at the podium, usually Dr. Fauci, who will say, none of those six things are true. The exact opposite is true in every one of those cases. Everything you just heard was wrong. He won't ever say it that way and he won't ever call out the president by name. He calls out other people instead. But there are already rumors in the press that Trump has noticed that and he doesn't like it. So this guy's days are numbered, and then we'll have only people like Mike Pompeo getting up and saying what the Chinese flu is doing to, to God-fearing white Christian Americans. Uh, Joe Biden's campaign has a chance to be the place where everybody goes. Talk about winning the election. He could do it on this subject. And he hasn't done it. Instead, he's been conspicuously absent. So that would be thing number one that I would say about Trump versus Biden in a post-pandemic world. And thing number two I would say is that the election is not going to take place, take place in a post-pandemic world. The election, the, the election, if it takes place at all, I maintain that it will not. That we will, for the first time in our history, not have a presidential election in November. Uh, and you heard that here first. <laughs> but uh, but uh, if it does, it won't be post-pandemic at all. Things will still be raging in November. I don't think this thing is going to slow down because of warm weather. And I think America, for instance, and other countries around the world have only seen the barest hint of what it's going to be like. The, the, you've all seen the images by now of what social distancing does to flatten the curve. But the point, uh, the point of the curve, of flattening the curve, is that there's still an end point. There's still a point in which this thing has infected almost everyone. 70-80% of the population. Before there's herd immunity, before there's a vaccine, before there's any kind of effective treatment. Basically, we're all going to get this. And uh, that's going to go on well into November. I, I think, I think we're, a post-pandemic world is a little bit optimistic there. I would like to think that the American people, once they realize that their businesses aren't going to reopen, once they realize that, uh, that multi-billionaires got far more handouts of government cash than they did, once their families can't make it, to say nothing of, of uh, fatalities among the people that they know, I would like to think that the American people, once they see all that, once they see the tangible proof of a botched disaster, it's a little slower here than bodies floating face down in New Orleans, but it's still a botched, a botched response in every way. Trump knew about this in January. His experts knew about this in January, and all they did in January was dump stocks. <laughs> didn't warn anybody. Didn't, they didn't raise any alarms. Didn't do anything like that. They denied it. In January. In January, they were saying this is nothing. <laughs> I would like to think that in November, if the election were to happen in November, uh, Trump would be resoundingly voted out on that alone, re regardless of anything else, that he would be resoundingly voted out on that alone. Uh, but I don't think we're ever going to find out, because it's going to be in his authority whether or not to have the elections. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, uh, let's see here. Amtrak Jack 42 uh, asked, number one, does Jeff Shara deserve to be mentioned in the same breath as his father? <laughs> That's a little harsh. Well, yes, he does. If we're talking, if maybe we're doing a roll call in the family or whatnot, if we're going through a family album. But if, if, if I understand your question to mean, does he, is he anything like the same kind of writer as his father? No. No, he's not. Jeff Shara's novels are solid, plotting, historical fiction. They can be, you can skip them all. There's never been one that 
rose even for a single chapter to the kind of brilliance in his father's one historical novel. So, no. In that sense, no. As writers, no. Uh, question number two. I love Louis L'Amour's Education of a Wandering Man. So do I. So do I. Your thoughts, and are there other similar books by other authors? Oh, yeah. There are plenty of books by other... Uh, 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 if by similar, I think what you mean is, here's what I learned from traveling the world. Well, then lots of people did that. Lots and lots of Louis L'Amour had lots of friends who did it. Sterling Hayden did one. A uh, bunch of other people. Uh... I'd have to put together a list. But yeah, I like that kind of writing. That kind of, I, I wandered all around, I knocked from port to port, and here's what I learned about life and about my craft. Uh, and question number three. Uh, I ordered the first ten Star Trek books on eBay, but I find James Blish's writing painful to read. <laughs> the dialogue especially. Am I missing something? No. You're not missing anything. He's a terrible, terrible, terrible writer. He is revered in Star Trek circles, and always will be. I revere myself. Because there was a time when we had nothing else. We had, we had... Star Trek 1, Star Trek 2, Star Trek 3, and we waited on it. And, and the proprietors of the dry goods store that had uh, just one metal spinner rack of paperbacks that they have to restock every month or two when a box comes in or when a rep comes in would suddenly notice that those were selling out and that no matter how many copies they ordered, so Star Trek 1, they ordered two copies that sold out. They got two more copies, those sold out. They got two more copies, those sold out. So they figured, okay, well, I'll, get, I'll take a chance on Star Trek 2, and they order 50 copies. And they all sell out on the same day, on the first day. So, so by Star Trek V, they're ordering as many copies as they can get their hands on, and they're still selling out, all of them, all at the same time. That was us. That was all we had were, were those James Blish novels. But even, the, even so, giving that reverence, it's due. He's a terrible writer. <laughs> and uh, now you science fiction fans are going to say, what about a case of conscience? What about his novels? No, he's a terrible science fiction author. All, whether he's writing Star Trek or anything else, he's just not good. Uh, he's C-rate at best. Uh, so, no, you're not missing anything if you see... The, the one the one mitigation I would say here is that Blish was working off studio scripts, so you can't lay all the blame at his feet for especially the dialogue, which would have been the first thing that would be written and that would be finalized. So you can't lay all of it at his feet. He couldn't change any of that or, or alter it very much. So, uh, But still, you're not missing anything, though. Uh, uh, Kojo Jojo asks, which would be more a more meaningful lecture, Ulysses by James Joyce or Infinite Jest by Edgar... by David Foster Wallace. A meaningful lecture, you mean a lecture on those works? Uh, well, as you know, I don't like either one of them, but I guess Joyce would be more interesting because it's had longer to infect the literary works that came after it. I, I, I wouldn't go to either lecture if it was free. <laughs> if they were held in the kitchen here, I wouldn't go. <laughs> but I'd probably, probably go with Joyce. Uh, Orthia NZ says, How would you deal with thinking and planning for the pandemic that is coming? It hasn't hit here yet. While getting sick and tired of hearing about it constantly. I know you've traveled to places where avoiding sickness has been important. Uh, penny for your thoughts. Well, I, I have traveled extensively, including lots of places where sickness was endemic. And I've just counted on the fact that I usually... I, I, I get sick the same as everybody else most of the time, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at surviving. I'm hoping that happens here, too. I'm hoping that... I am, I am assuming, I'm operating on the assumption that we are all going to get this virus at some point or another. Now, the, the cases have varied wildly. Large numbers of people get it and don't experience anything uh, worse than a minor bout of the flu. Plenty of people in all age groups get it and it lays them flat. And, and then there is a small percentage of people who get it and get it so bad that they need to be hospitalized or they'll die. And then there's, the, there's a, a small percentage of those who die anyway, even with hospital care. So it's all across the spectrum, and we don't have any immunity to it. It's a new virus, so that, which is why uh, countries and municipalities are, are reacting to it the way they are, because they can't fall back on anything. Uh, and as to reading and preparing for it, well, the, prepare, the preparations are easy. The things that you should have done anyway. I fell behind, um, a lot of people did too, but nevertheless, you should have, always, a pantry of canned goods, of, of non-perishable food. You should always have a pantry like that. It's going to be hard to build that pantry now because everybody is out there sweeping store shelves clean. But nevertheless, you need that. Uh, and then distractions to keep your mental health. And then just follow the health profession guidelines. Stay away from other people. Stay inside your house as much as possible. Only go out once in a while to get food supplies or whatever else you need but no frivolous outings of any kind you can take you can go out for a run out in the wilderness you can take a dog out for a walk in the wilderness but don't talk to people unless you're a good distance away from them and don't congregate with anybody 
stay in so that we can all make a fire break, a space where this thing can't jump. That's what, that's what we want to do. We want to make a space where it can't jump. Uh, and the only way to do that is to stay away from each other. A very hard mandate for the world's most social species, but nevertheless, the only species that could carry it out. So, I, I, as to books, <sighs> I know people who are reading up obsessively on plagues and pandemics. And I read, I reread a few of the books that I have myself. The one I would recommend is uh, Spillover by David Quammen, who saw this coming eight years ago. Uh, but so I know some people, that's the last thing they want to read. They don't want to read about that at all. I would say go by your own mental health. Don't force yourself to read something that's making you agitated. Your stress is a big deal here, as it is in all cases. Stress will only make things worse. So you have Steve's permission <laughs> to comfort read your heart's content. Uh, well, let's see here. Bookish, uh, another well-known troublemaker, uh, says, In which African nation did you have the best, most rewarding experience, and what was it? Uh, well, the, the African nation where I've had the most rewarding experiences when, was Namibia. And that's because I have an old, an old friend who lives there, and, and was, she was my host whenever I was there, and we went out wandering around. And I, the, the best experience that I had when I was there is a little bit on the surreal side. It's a little bit weird. Uh, uh, she introduced me to an elephant. A, a full-grown male African elephant. She introduced me to an elephant. <laughs> I was terrified, absolutely terrified. Nothing that you see on film can prepare you for how big these animals are. Nothing can. And it, it's not just how big they are. It's that when you're in their immediate proximity, that is when you feel how powerful they are. They are immeasurably strong. Immeasurably so. And... As if that weren't all bad enough, when you are near one and you look up into his eye, you see an intelligence that's every bit as great as your own. It's alien, completely alien to your own, but it's not less. The eye is looking back at you, is what I'm saying. And you're looking at this in an animal that could snap you into, in, into a, a million pieces with no effort at all on its own part. It could do that with a flick of its ear. So that was a surreal experience to, to meet such a creature so close and be guaranteed my safety only because my friend guaranteed it. I myself have provided that experience for, for people in my own life. I, I have provided that experience time, time and time again for people where they have a vicious dog in their neighborhood and I say, well, I'm, I'm standing right here next to him and my hand is on his shoulder and he is not going to bite you. He's not even going to growl at you. He's not going to do anything like that. Why don't you come forward and pat him on the head, just so you can know what it's like. I myself have done that, but <laughs> that elephant is so big. <laughs> so I'm going to say that. For, and Namibia. Namibia is beautiful. Just a beautiful place. Uh, <clears throat> let's see here. Turkey Pot Pie asks, What epistolary novels would you recommend, especially comedic ones? And do you have any advice for people looking to write their own? Writing your own, I, 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 there are quite a few epistolary novels that I love. Not many that I know of that I really love that are comedic. I think I'm one of the only people in the world who likes Letters by John Barth, for instance. I'm a big fan of John Barth, just in general. But writing your own? Who writes an epistolary novel in 2020? Are you talking about email? Where the, the people would be exchanging emails and that's what the epistolaries would be? The epistles would be? Nobody writes letters anymore. So the epistolary novel is gone. At least in its traditional form. It, it stood around for 300 years, but it's, it's now gone. Nobody writes letters anymore. Uh, what are your thoughts on the game, on the genre of video games called interactive fiction? For the uninitiated, that would be me. Uh, such games are, compromised in lar are comprised in large part, <clears throat> often entirely, of text. With perhaps the most famous example being the text parser adventure games such as Zork or H2G2. Interactive fiction games can also incorporate graphics or sounds, and in the case of somewhat recent horror example, My Father's Long, Long Legs. Do you think interactive fiction suffers from the same pitfalls as a, a game like Skyrim? Well, I don't know enough about it. Uh, it sounds like the game in Wolf in White Van. Uh, what was that called? Uh, there's, a, there's a game, there's a, a text-based game. It's not a video game, it's a, it's a correspondence game. You send it... it, it I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of it, but uh, I don't know this at all. I, I would tend to think uh, that it, it's compromised because I'm sure it has rules. 
And I, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't. Uh, I'd have to look into them. I don't know enough about, uh, what's it called? Interactive fiction? Uh, a view from the bar. Oh, God, another troublemaker. Uh, let's see here. Number one. If you could flash forward 50 years to read a single comprehensive thousand-page history about something that's going on today in 2020 and see what its outcome and ramifications were, what event or subculture or general 2020 thing would you want to read about? I have an answer to this question, and it's not COVID-19. COVID-19 is, is a new virus. It will disrupt societies, it will end lots of businesses, but humans have experienced this before. And the thing that I want to read about in a 50-year retrospective has also happened before. But uh, no American has ever looked at a new virus and said there's no chance of that happening here. Whereas every American says the thing that I'm talking about will not happen here. And that is the change in, in America from a representative democracy to an autocracy, to an oligarchy, a ruling oligarchy where, with a disenfranchised and subsidized general population. But where, where the idea that you, that you participate in your own democracy and have power over its representatives is long gone. The change, in other words, from Republican Rome to Imperial Rome is going to happen in the next 50 years in this country, unless I'm very much mistaken. It's going to happen. It's already happened. There are huge... If, if you consistently put people in, in a position of power over you that has control of your country's military arsenal, in other words, the ability to destroy all life on Earth, if you routinely put a person in that position of authority who lost the popular vote, then you are well on your way to being an imperial power and not a representative one. I'd like to see, if I could read something 50 years from now about, I wonder what historians then would be saying about what the key events are now, that are in our newspapers now. Uh, and then his second question, uh, based on your reading, in which historical period, apart from those in which you've lived, do you think you personally would have been most fun and fit in most comfortably? Ancient Rome, old Venice, uh, 1920s literary scene in New York City, etc. <laughs> I don't know. I'm thinking maybe, oh, I don't know, 8th century Donegal. I'm thinking something like 8th century Donegal on the coast with a bunch of dogs. Uh, I doubt I'd have to change my hygiene at all. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Curly Book says, I've just started reading Moby Dick for the first time. Oh, lucky you. Uh, and I'm really enjoying it so far. In a recent video, you said you have like 11 copies. What do you love so much about this novel? I'd love to be inspired by your insights about the book. Well, I love the novel. I think it's the, the most successful 19th century American novel of them all. But I want, I want to stress here, I, I, love, I love its starkness. I love its Old Testament vigor. Uh, I love its playful eloquence. Uh, but I want to stress here that I don't know why I have so many copies of Moby Dick. It's not because I love it so much. There are books I love more than Moby Dick that I don't have a dozen or more copies of. I don't know why I keep getting copies of Moby Dick. It's not, it's not a one-to-one -one reflection at all. Uh, what are we doing for? Oh my, oh goodness gracious. All right, I'm going to stop this and we're going to come right back to part two. <laughs> I don't want these videos to be too long to upload. I will see you in a minute.